my name's Ben, and a little bit about me. I'm currently in my final year of sixth form, and I study maths, economics, and biology. I was always aware that this was an imminent issue, but only recently have I realised that I needed to be involved in the fight against it. So I've attended youth climate strikes, entered a Bank of England essay competition on climate change in the economy, and participated in the Youth Climate Assembly. By being involved in all these events, I was able to discover a breadth of passion from other people. In addition to this, I presented at the first Brighton Climate Assembly meeting on climate change and its impact on the youth. It was an incredible experience and was encouraging to see that councillors were eager to hear the perspective of the youth. I'm also on Brighton Hove Youth Council and we are currently running a campaign to reduce plastic wastage and promote being environmentally friendly. I believe we should all continue to voice our opinions as they are so important and through these events we can all be heard. Hopefully by the end of this event we will all gain a better understanding of the local action against climate change so we can, 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 so we can continue to fight this crucial issue. I'll now hand over to Rania to introduce herself. Thanks, Ben. So hi, my name is Rania and I'll be co-hosting this event alongside Ben. I'm a final year undergraduate student at the University of Sussex studying international development and sociology. Since moving to Brighton for uni, I have been involved in the climate youth strikes and more specifically in setting up a youth assembly on climate in Brighton, which focused on the topic of transport. It was an amazing experience to see how active and informed young people are about climate change and how much enthusiasm there is for action and change. The recommendations went sent to the council to be considered in parallel to the recommendations of the main assembly. The creative energy and the discussions that came out of this youth assembly were a very empowering thing to be a part of and we want this project to continue in the future and to keep young people directly involved in the decision making processes on climate issues in Brighton and Hove. And I was also the youth representative on the advisory board for the Climate Assembly in Brighton and Co. So this event is part of a series of Q&As with local decision makers on the climate emergency. There's been one with MPs, um, another that was organised with school students asking questions to their three MPs and councillors on their thoughts on action, um, on their thoughts and actions on the climate emergency. 2021 is a big year in terms of how we step up to the challenges. At a global level, the COP26 meeting in November may see international efforts really pick up speed and pace. At a national level, the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill gives our MPs the opportunity to support a parliamentary response to the emergency. The bill, amongst other things, ensures that the UK contributes fairly to climate mitigation consistent with limit with limiting global temperatures increases to 1.5 degrees. It also ensures that the UK takes full responsibility in accounting for its entire greenhouse gas footprint domestically and internationally. Um, it's also um, encouraging the active conservation and restoration of nature here and overseas, recognizing the damage we cause through the goods we import. It encourages those in power not to depend on future technologies to resolve climate change, and also wants a citizens assembly with randomly selected but representative sample of the UK population to work alongside government on the scrutiny of parliament. And finally, locally, our council has just heard the report and recommendation from our city's first climate assembly. And the council has released the 2030 carbon neutral plan, which was discussed at the Environment, Sustainability and Transport Committee on the 16th of March, and at the Policy and Resources Committee, committee on the 18th of March. Moving on to introducing the speakers, Gary Wilkinson. He's been a councillor in Brighton and Hove since 2017. He represents Central Hove Ward and is Labour's opposition spokesperson for environment, transport and sustainability. He's also a member of the council's carbon neutral working group. Phelan McCafferty has been a councillor since 2011. He became leader of the council in July 2020 and he represents Brunswick and Adelaide Ward for the Green Party. Samir Bagain was elected a councillor in Brighton and Hove in May 2019. He represents Hove Park Ward on behalf of the Conservative Party. And so, um, before asking your questions, could you please unmute yourself and then say your name? And then Samir, Felim and Gary, could you please try to limit your answers to around a minute and a half? Otherwise, we will need to cut you off if we go over too much. So, moving on to our first question, and I don't believe Rosie is here yet, so I'm... I'll ask this one. Um, this is 
to uh, Felim, Samir, and then Gary. And um, the question is, the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill is gaining um, cross-party support. Will you be supporting full council to register Brighton Ho's support for the bill on the 25th of March? I believe I'm first. Um, yes, I'm seconding the motion. Uh, it's clear already that councils across the country are leading the way on tackling the immense challenge of climate change. There's already been a huge movement of councils declaring climate emergencies. Uh, here uh, in 2018, we followed our green colleagues in Bristol uh, when we secured cross-party backing to declare the climate and biodiversity crises. And that's uh, exactly what it is. It's an emergency. It requires emergency action. Um, you just heard how we held the Climate Assembly and last night and on Tuesday agreed our plan for carbon neutrality by 2030. We're accelerating work to deliver that pledge. Although councils are leading the way, government sadly is trading behind and we can't do it all because we don't have all of the power. So rather than 10 point plans for a climate revolution uh, from the government, if the government were serious, we need binding climate tar targets enshrined in laws that apply everywhere in the UK. So it's not in councils or others to raise their voices. And so that government and big business, crucially, are truly accountable. That's what the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill does. It's co-sponsored by, of course, Caroline Lucas, Clive Lewis, among others. Next Thursday, we're requesting that all councillors voice support for such a bill, not just by taking the call to Parliament, but also by asking councillors to allow our council to join what's known as the UK 100. That's a strong alliance of 100 councils pushing for change for our environment and demonstrating lead serious leadership on the issue. It builds on our request that council supports the pioneering Future Generations Act that's been around in Wales. In Wales, that effectively binds councils and decision makers to consider the well-being of future generations in all that they do. Welsh lawmakers are not allowed to shirk that moral or ethical responsibility. And just finally, for local action on climate change to be effective, national and big business action must be held to account. That's what the bill does. It's time for more than lip service. It's time for law and lesson enforcement where polluters finally pay. And in the year of COP26, we're going to be loud in our support for this. And we hope that all councillors support our call for the bill next Thursday. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. Now, um, Samir, please. Um, you're on mute, Samir. Sorry, apologies. I think Zoom has just been playing up. Um, so yeah, I'm aware of the notice of motion coming through because I think that was that was the question. And the three bits to the to the notice of motion. One is is the climate ecological emergency bill, um, which which I must admit I've, I've spoken to colleagues outside of the council about this. So what I'm going to give you is my my personal view on that as to what I think needs to happen. I, I don't think we necessarily need a bill. I think we need an executive that can actually get things done. And in a sense, you know, there is, there is that, that struggle that I, that I kind of feel sometimes between actually talking about something and, and doing it. So um, I mean, I'm inclined to say I probably will vote against that as it currently stands. There are two other things within that notice of motion that are crucial. One of them is, is the council joining UK 100, which is a network of cities supporting, uh, if you like, delivery of targets as we move towards COP26. So I'm in favor of that and I actually support UK 100 in our work. So that's crucial. The other part of this is carrying on as a council to work uh, across, across party lines as part of our climate working group and definitely support that. And I think like, uh, like Rania and Phelan and Gary, you know, we all sit on the, on the cross party working group. We, we worked on the climate assembly. We all sat on the on the advisory board. I think we need to look for innovation elsewhere like that executive. You know, I believe that there is a, a lot of money out there for us to get things done. You know, our, our targets, because that's in the bill, um, our targets are coming down. You know, our emissions are halfway to net zero now. And that target is, you know, it's fair enough, it's, it's 2050. But I believe we are on target to be in a good place by 2030 without, without 
the bill specifically. So I think we should focus on getting things done rather than just talk about bills and acts and so on. Thank you for your answer. And now Gary, please. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Thank you, I was having a bit of trouble. So thank you for this question. I can say with confidence that the Labour Group will support this emergency bill. The Climate and Ecology Emergency Bill Alliance, made up of scientists, lawyers and activists, tabled a private member's bill in Parliament. The bill has the potential to become the most significant move forward since the Climate Change Act of 2008. And to date, over 80 MPs have so far supported the bill, with sponsors from across the political spectrum, including Labour, Liberal, Democrat and Green MPs. And the bill sets an emergency path for the UK to follow, including the creation of citizen assemblies, ensuring that the UK appears as fair and proper role in limiting global temperatures to 1.5 degrees centigrade and actually conserving the natural world. All governments have a duty to limit the negative impacts of climate and ecological breakdown. And local governments should not wait for their national governments to change their policies. The Climate and Eco Ecological Bill deserves support as it reassesses the urgency of the twin climate and eco ecological emergencies. But as a council, we can go further. While we were busy tackling the pandemic, the climate emergency hasn't gone away. Global warming is not paused for lockdown and saving the planet we live on cannot wait for quieter times. We must act now. And as the lockdown ends, or when it comes to being ending, there'll be no going back to normal because normal wasn't working. We need a new recovery. We need a transformation to how things should be. We need a real Green New Deal with investment in jobs and infrastructure. And that's why supporting the Climate and Ecological Emergency Bill will ensure climate and ecological crisis is not merely declared but it's acted upon with the urgency it deserves. We declared an emergency. It would have been sense for the government to have brought this forward and take legislative action itself, but instead here we are, over a year later, having to cajole and drag them into action. Make no mistakes, it is people like you and me, grassroots pressure from people that will demonstrate that lawmakers must pay attention and take direct action now. And I personally will be supporting this bill and urging all my colleagues to do so. Thank you. Thank you all three for your answers. Thank you. Um, the second question is asked by Alison and will be answered first by Samir, followed by Gary and followed by Philem. Hi, everybody. My name is Alison. I'm a climate activist here. I've been doing it for ages. Um, I'm coming to full council next Thursday with a deputation. It's about food production. Food production alone is set to push the earth past 1.5 degrees warming. Loads and loads and loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of research backs it up. I've got a little bit in my deputation. Um, and I'm coming with a request. Um, and there's lots of help to get this done. If you will take this forward, please. Um, uh, so um, my request is that you have a higher percentage of plant-based foods in schools and that all council events are solely plant-based. Will you support this carbon methane reduction measure? Because I noticed when I looked at the climate action plan, that was great, but food wasn't in it. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Samir? Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, Alison, for that. And again, I, I must admit, I've, I've not read the, the, the deputation, but I look forward to you coming in and, and talking to us about this. Um, I mean, I, I definitely believe, and, I, and we actually do that at home, you know, in, in terms of cutting waste and actually locally sourced food um, and the rest of it. I believe you're specifically talking about plant-based food, but I think your reference, just looking at the question as it points, is so it's, it's in schools, and, and at the council, and obviously I, you know, I, I cannot speak about the council, but as somebody with, with two kids at school, I definitely believe that they should have that, that particular choice uh, at school. Now, I, I don't know how far you're suggesting they go because I've, 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 I, I don't necessarily say this is, this is to do with you, but I think there should be choice and there should be the option and, and funny enough, I was watching something on Netflix the other day. I don't know if you've seen this program called Explained. And actually there is, a, there is one of those programs is on plant-based food and plant-based burgers and actually how you can get kids to, to 
become involved and engaged in that sort of thing on the back of, I think on the back of a Katy Perry dressing as a burger, not that, not that long ago. So there are options out there that are actually coming through. There is innovation coming through in terms of creating credible alternatives for children. And I think part of that is about not only the plant-based, but the, it's also about the look and the feel and the taste so that actually kids engage and, and, and eat all of that. And I think that's absolutely important. I'm going to have to cut you, Samir, sorry. <laughs> um, Gary? Thank you for putting this question, Alison. And I look forward to seeing you at full council with your deputation and in engaging with us. Schools play a crucial role in setting healthy eating habits for children at an early age. Only 18% of children are currently meeting the recommended five portions of fruit and vegetables a day in the UK. And more plant-based meals in schools would help improve school children's access to nutritious foods, as well as promoting planetary health. A, health a healthy plant-based diet is suitable at every age and can also reduce one's risk of chronic diseases. The meat and dairy production and fishing industry are responsible for at least 18% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Intensive animal farming poses a significant threat in terms of the emergence of new pandemics. And a plant-based diet can use up to 2.5 times less carbon emissions than a meat diet. And this is due to a number of factors. Research has shown that the biggest change we can make to reduce our environmental impact is to adopt a plant-based diet. Labour raised the question back in council in January. We asked the current administration in consultation with schools to seek to introduce one meat-free day and another pl fully plant-based meat day per week across all our schools by the start of the autumn term to encourage diet, ch diet change and demonstrate another contribution to this city making to mitigate the global climate crisis. By promoting vegan diets, councils can improve the overall health and well-being of citizens alongside improvements in environmental sustainability. Improvements Thank you, Gary. Sorry, I'm going to have to cut you too. <laughs> That's fine. I just want to say I wanted to work cross-party with all people to get this achieved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Philip? Uh, thanks for the question, Alison. Uh, we've been, as you might know, long-term long -term campaigners for broader, healthier and environmentally friendly options being made available to support the health of both pupils and the planet. We also have long-standing support for work on food, reducing food waste. We, we became the first gold food city in the United Kingdom just months ago, and that recognises the amazing work by all those in our community to support uh, with healthy food, but also reduce our carbon impact at the same time. As you will all know, a whole third of greenhouse gases come from food. So we need to talk about production as we, as we do at waste. I signed the Glasgow Food Declaration in December, which is basically cities all over the world, such as ours, calling on national governments to play their full part in securing sustainable food and farming at the heart of the global response to the climate emergency at COP26. And earlier this week, I was talking to Nourish Scotland, who are a bit like Scotland's version of our food partnership, about how we embed this work at the COP. Children's Leads have begun conversations with our school meals contractor, Caterlink, to consider using more completely vegan plant-based foods. Also, I think it's an important point in time to dispel myths. This isn't about taking away choice, it's actually about enhancing it. We're also going to review how the tender for a school meals contract is specified to enhance the vegan option when it comes to retendering the service in the coming year. Uh, it also goes hand in hand though with education and the budget that we said a few weeks ago saw us introduce resources for environmental education and support uh, amazing initiatives in our schools, such as our brilliant climate change teachers. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. So um, our third question is asked by Susan Goodwin. This will be answered by Gary, Phelan and then Samir. Thank you for raising this question, Susan, and raising this important issue. You are absolutely right to raise these concerns about council pensions invested in fossil fuel companies, and they are concerns that your Labour councillors wholeheartedly share. This is why we work with the Green Party to pass a joint motion at council in October on this matter, asking for East Sussex Pension Committee to completely phase out the funds invested in fossil fuels and to highlight the overcapacity and fragility of the fossil fuel system. 
We are pleased to have won support for this motion, and we are pleased that East Sussex have made commitments to disinvest an ethical investment and are monitoring their progress. Right now, how City Council pensions are part of the East Sussex Local Government Pension Scheme. The scheme is administered by East Sussex County Council. That committee oversees the pensions for East Sussex County Council, Brighton and Howard City, City Council, as well as the borough and district councils, some academies, universities, colleges, and public authorities in East Sussex. A large ch chunk of those funds is managed by an even bigger conglomerate, conglomerate of councils across the southeast. Brighton and Howard City Council do have representatives on the board that provides oversight and scrutiny of the East Sussex County Council management of pensions, currently one of our green councillors. What we do is lobby directly to the East Sussex County Council councillors by our representatives. While in administration, Labour declared a climate emergency, set up the city's first ever climate assembly and set to work on making Brighton and Hove a carbon neutral city by 2030. Labour councillors will continue to look to influence the East Sussex County Council Pensions Committee to encourage them to divest from fossil fuels, and we look further to opportunities to raise this, this issue in the Brighton and Hove City Council. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry, just before Phelan starts, it would be great, um, Susan, if you could actually ask your question uh, to the councillors directly, that would be great. Thank you. My question was, how can Brighton and Hove City Council correct their current position of not having enough power in the legal decision-making forum on divestment from fossil fuel investment to be able to get it closer to its own carbon neutral goal. This is because encouragement is not the same as having legal clout. And I believe there is some historic reason for that. I'd like to know more. Thank you so much. And Fina, if you could answer that. Thanks, Susan, for the question. To answer it, uh, we need to keep up the consistent fight. As you might understand, we've been long-standing campaigners on this. We've lobbied the Sussex Pensions Committee. We've made public statements, interviews, blogs. Um, we've been doing all sorts of protests. Uh, we put forward a notice of motion on divestment from fossil fuels back in 2015. Sadly, we didn't have support from either of the other parties at the time, but two years later, Labour did uh, perform a welcome U-turn, which was really great. Uh, some of the issue here is that currently Brighton and Hope has a seat on the East Sussex Pensions Board, but the board is mainly responsible for um, governance, day-to-day -day governance issues. The actual decisions on the investment policy are made by the Pensions Committee. So a key part of our work is that we're going to keep pushing for representation on that committee. And last night, Policy and Resources Committee endorsed asking the Council's Chief Executive, Jeff Raw, to contact the Sussex Pensions Committee and directly ask again for better representation, particularly given the contribution Brighton and Hove City Council makes to the pension pot. This is also about democratic oversight too. The committee is made up of five East Sussex County councillors with no representation from Brighton and Hove City Council. That's a massive democratic deficit, considering that Brighton and Hove is about a third of the combined population. And according to population, we really should have about two out of five of those seats. If that were the case, they would be occupied by councillors in favour of divestment, given that there have been two successful council notices of motion passed on the issue. In order for this to happen, we need enough councillors on the committee to agree. So this is where our focus is at present. Divestment of, is, of course, a powerful and important step towards halting climate change. Greens will continue to push for proper representation. And Sorry, I'm going to have to cut you off there. Sorry. Ultimately, divestment. Thank you. Lovely, thank you, thank you, Susan, for your question. So I'm 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 not a member of this of this um, pension group. So I think I can I can possibly speak more 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 freely than than some of my colleagues. I mean, I I need to look into the history of this, but I don't understand what's the holdup, quite frankly, because the market is moving so quickly now, and and we've got vehicles in place for supporting this divestment in, in pension funds. You know, it's, I, I do this as part of my work and we sit with, with, we invite pension funds who invest in the built environment and they know that they are now under an obligation to invest in, in green. And certainly the framework for them to do that in terms of responsible investment. And there's a forum called the Principles for Responsible Investors that actually hold the pension funds to account. And then there's obviously the government back, the task force for climate related financial disclosures. I think more importantly now, 
the task force for, for uh, climate related, nature uh, related financial disclosures. So we've got the vehicles in place and, and the funds themselves are also under pressure and they are transforming because they know that they have to invest along ESG principles, that environmental, social and, and, and governance. And, and the, the amount of money that is invested now along those lines is on the increase. So I suspect, you know, if they're refusing to switch at this moment in time, I suspect they will have to be prolonged because that's the current market trajectory. I don't think that position is tenable for, for that much longer, quite frankly, you know, and it, it will happen before long. I am absolutely certain of that. Thank you, all three of you. Um, so the fourth question is asked by um, Chris Todd, and the answers will be from um, Philem, Samir, and Gary. Is Chris here? Yeah, thanks, Rania. Okay. <laughs> um, just very brief context is transport is the sector that is sort of out of control in terms of emissions and electrification of, of vehicles cannot happen quickly enough. So in that context, how will the council deliver the necessary rapid decarbonisation of transport without a rapid shift to walking and cycling and public transport when many councillors are opposing much needed changes to make roads safer? Thank you so much for this question. So, Philem? Uh, so it's a shame to see councillors desperately opposing the much needed action on active travel and air quality that supports safer travel around our city for those who don't drive or don't want to keep having to use a car. 38% of our city don't even own a car. I think it says it all that the government's own chief of public health has looked at the cost to the NHS and the benefits of walking and cycling and called it, and I quote, a miracle cure. We're committed to this work. We're committed to inclusion and consultation. Um, the Department for Transport over the summer shared that even they want councils to press ahead despite opposition. They said, for all the controversy they can sometimes cause, ambitious cycling and walking schemes have significant, if quieter, majority support. The Department for Transport, for example, found 65% of people across England support reallocating road space to walking and cycling. Furthermore, as leader of the council, it would be a complete dereliction of my duty to not act on air quality. I will not allow this to happen, especially after the death of Ellie Cassie Deborah, the young girl in London. My first job as council leader is to protect people's lives and air pollution in our city is killing people. In fact, it kills 175 people locally and 36,000 nationally. It also, as we all know, causes short and long-term health conditions. And as we tackle COVID-19, which is a respiratory virus that affects our lungs, it would be completely irresponsible for me not to take action on air quality. I'm delighted that we've just agreed a local transport plan for greater investment in cycling and walking. We put more than four and a half million into the pot. We've also put aside available funding at in the next year, and that's been increased by approximately 16 million of additional that's capital funding you, for investment. Thanks. Um, Samir? Lovely. Thank you, Rania. And thank you, Chris. And I know you and I probably don't disagree or dis don't agree on, on a lot of it. I mean, look, transport, yes, is a big deal. I think where, where I sit, I think it's, it's the built environment. I think it's our buildings that actually contribute the most, both, both in embodied and operational carbon. And I think that's probably the bigger challenge than, 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 than transport, at least just setting, setting my stall. In, in terms of cycle lanes and, and local plans and so on, look, um, do we have a vision, leadership and political will to do this? You know, we may have one or two, but I don't think we have the vision yet to actually do and, and to do what, what, what people need in terms of putting cycle lanes where people actually need them, because I think that's important. There is investment, yes, and that investment is coming through from central government. Are we basing our decisions in investing in our cycle lanes based on data and evidence? You know, that's, that's, there's, there's a lot of back and forth on that. And I don't think that we're actually um, doing that in terms of uh, be, being open enough in, in terms of how we approach that. If you ask me what our vision should be, I say, look, uh, we need a plan, and, and I know the, the leader just said that we've, we've done a plan. Are we aligned with, with our city agenda or our national agenda? Probably. 
are we putting these things where we've got job centers and, and places where people can go to work? Probably not, because I don't, I think we've got a separation between our transport and our economic strategies. So that's problematic for me. I'm going to have to cut you, Nancy, sorry. Okay. Um, Gary? Thank you for this question, Chris. Transport is now the UK's biggest contributor to climate change. Whereas in 1990, it accounted for less than a fifth, 1% of UK greenhouse gas emissions, it now counts for more than a third, 34%, and transport carbon emissions are flatlining or even rising. Government departments responsible for every other sector of the economy have cut carbon, but the DFT has gone rogue, pursuing policies that actively make things worse. Rapid action to reduce car use will only be fair and command public consent if it takes place in parallel with big changes to our transport system that gives people decent, clean and affordable ways of traveling to work, education and services by foot, bike or on low carbon public transport. As a council, we need to act. Labour has been promoting the use of electric vehicles and introducing charging points across the city. Introduce government emergency active puzzle me travel measures such as Madeira Drive and we supported a joint motion supporting a car fee city centre and ultra low emission zone. There is no opt-out on climate change. If we don't like the steps that are necessary to prevent it and fail to act, the cost both to us and future generations would be enormous. The biggest winners would be those who are worst off now, older people, children, and low-income households, nearly half which don't have a car. Cars will not disappear, but we will use them much less often because other means of transport would be more efficient, affordable, and attractive. And it is up to us a council to work cross party to ensure this happens. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. So um, our fifth question will be asked by Susie Maxwell Stewart. <coughs> this will be answered by Samir, Gary, Ellen Phelan. Thank you very much, Benjamin. Um, I've seen postcards of the future of Brighton and Hove flooded in future years. I think I saw these in a, a fringe event. Uh, only once uh, over the years, but how true would this be and what measures do we have to take as citizens to stop this, if it is true? Uh, Samir, if you could answer first. Thank you, thank you for that, Susan. I've, I've not seen the postcards that, that, that you have seen. Um, is, is it a realistic proposition? You know, it, given the storms that we've had over the last 10 years, you know, it's, it's, I don't think any of us can discount anything because certainly what we're seeing is that the events that are supposed to be happening once every 100 years are actually happening once every 20 years and in some cases uh, on an accelerated pace. So definitely I think we should be mindful that this is a, a potential problem for us here in the city. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot that we can do, and and I think what, one of those things is to learn from cities that regularly flood and actually see see what can happen in those instances. You know, certainly the bigger cities like New York, when it flooded during uh, during the recent hurricanes, you know, their underground network flooded, their homes flooded, the power went out, and what that highlights, at at least for me, as a, as a professional working in this field and as 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 your counselor is that there are interdependencies here between what we're seeing in terms of climate shifts, what we're seeing in terms of the resilience of our infrastructure, and what we're seeing in terms of the dependence on the services that then depend on our ability to carry on delivering the services that we are delivering in spite of these things happening. We need a connected thread across all of these, um, and that's preparedness. You know, Do we have a preparedness plan for this particular scenario? Probably not. Is it likely? It, it is definitely more likely now than it was 10, 20 years ago. And, and I definitely would work with, with colleagues in effect to make sure that we are ready and assess the risk and actually deliver a plan that helps us to cope with this when this tech comes. I believe in preparedness better than actually reacting after the event. Thank you, Susan. Um, thank you, Samir. Now, Gary, please. Thank you, Susie, for that question. According to the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the worst impacts of climate change could be irreversible by 2030. 2019 was the second hottest year on record, 
with the global average temperature of 1.1 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial period, every fraction of a degree of global warming will bring more risks to health, food, security and water supply, threatening our economies, livelihood and lives. If we don't take radical action now, it will be too late. 2021 is recognised as the make or break year to make a real impact on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. We know the risks of inaction, that's why we declared a climate emergency in Brighton, and that's why we should welcome the work of our recent climate assembly. Past emissions mean some climate change is in inevitable. It's essential we respond by, by planning ahead. Climate change is having a clear impact on the way water moves around our world. And simply put, climate change impacts on our weather largely by putting a water cycle into overdrive. As a city, we need to look at ways we can combat that. But as individuals, we all have a place, to, a part to play in this. We can all make changes to our lifestyles by driving less, thinking more about our carbon emissions, which will all impact on the climate change uh, temperatures. The ultimate way to stop flooding due to climate change would be to reduce the amount of particulate matter that we are putting into the atmosphere and reversing the warming cycle that we are currently in. And I will do everything with my colleagues on the council to ensure that we introduce policies and work together cross party to ensure that we protect all the citizens of Brighton and Hove from any flooding which you've dramatically described in your postcard. Thank you. Thank you so much for your answer, Gary. Um, in, in response to the question, Susie, sadly flooding already happened in the city, so this is a reality already. Parts of Patcham, Hove and Portslade alone Floods have occurred almost every other year since 1990. Brighton and Hove is ranked eighth in an environment agency list of 10 cities where more than 30,000 people are at risk of flooding. We need to tackle this at source, not leave it all up to residents as this is bigger. This is about climate action and our carbon neutral plan. So along with the other councils along the coast and our partners, we've reflected a whole series of bits of work in our carbon neutral plan, including how we're going to uh, defend the coast how we're going to manage our shoreline, replenish our shingle beaches, how we're going to protect uh, the bits of the coast next to us. And also a really important part of the work is developing and uh, building a citywide programme of sustainable urban drainage schemes. So that protects the highways and property from surface water flooding and extreme weather events and to protect the really important chalk aquifer that's underneath, of, underneath us. Um, you may have seen the uh, Sustainable Urban Drainage Schemes in action up in Patcham, where we've been installing soakaways on Carden Avenue. And that, would, that work will allow water to run off the streets into roadside soakaways, alleviating flooding. Longer term, we've also got a, a, a piece of work and planning known as a supplementary planning document that will longer term help with the problem as well. In terms of your point on what measures do we have to take as citizens, we need resilient house building that reflects the fact that sadly flooding is here to stay. Working together to protect the wetlands, plant trees uh, and vital work on rewilding. Those things like restore many natural habitats, but there are natural flood drainage. Getting rid of, for example, things like grass verges and replacing them with driveways impacts on flood prevention too. On top of our retrofitting programme, we're inspired by projects like that in Sheffield where they've gone grey to green, which is the UK's largest retrofit at uh, sustainable urban drainage scheme project as well thank you thank you so much for all your answers the next question is asked by eliana and the answers are from gary then philem then samir eliana's not here um oh, okay. I'll just say it would be great if you could read it out I'll read the question. Um, when are you going to start testing and publishing the river and sea water quality on a weekly basis and holding southern water to account beyond the extent of a fine that they just view as an operating cost? Um, Gary? Thank you, and thank you for the question. Um, in terms of rivers, the most local river is the Ada, which is an Ada district council outside of the city's boundaries. Issues such as water quality of the Ada would be managed by the Environment Agency. In terms of the sea, we hold regular meetings with Environmental Agency in Southern Water, where issues around water quality um, are planned and talked about. We also work closely with local organisations such as Surface Against Sewage on issues around beach cleanliness, cleanliness, water quality and marine pollution. 
recently surfaced against sewage were successful in their campaign to ensure that water companies make real-time data on sewage discharges available at bathing sites all year round. Meetings with Southern Water will produce, provide Brighton Hall City Council with an opportunity to find out how this will be implemented in practice. And the Greater Brighton Energy and Water Plans agreed in 2020 brought together public sector, businesses and academic stakeholders across the city region. They identified opportunities for energy and water infrastructure that will support object objectives for decarbonisation and economic growth in renewable energy, power, heat and transport. We have a corporate plan to work with our partners and we need to reduce water pollution to become a sustainable city. We will happily work with the administration and others to look at this and support the council's aims of working with Southern Water to improve water quality. And we will look at this as part of the carbon neutral programme we have just adopted in council and our wider work to tackle the climate crisis. Thank you, Gary. I'm going to have to cut you. Thank you. Um, Thank Fina? you. Thank you. Thank you and thanks for the question. Um, I've met now a number of times with Southern Water and the fantastic campaigners from Surfers Against Sewage um, along with the Chair of the Environment Committee and we've continued the really important discussion about uh, sea quality. I understand especially with lockdown and the issue is even more pertinent as many more people are sea swimming, canoeing um, and so on. Um, so we've, we've already been looking at some of the issues that the question raises. There's sadly a limit uh, to what powers the local council has with private utility companies. This is yet another casualty of the disastrous privatisation of the utility companies. So that limits exactly what we can do. Um, so if the infrastructure was in our ownership, for example, we would be able to um, provide uh, data and, and, and keep things uh, accountable to uh, the public. We're sadly unable to do that, but that's exactly why we're keeping a dialogue with them I'm meeting Southern Water on Tuesday, again with Surfers Against Sewage, um, who I've had a long relationship with from the time that we uh, brought forward proposals on single-use plastics, which is equally uh, as big an issue. And especially as the weather warms up, we've got a, we've got a great plan in place to try and keep our sea uh, free of single-use plastics. We're going to carry on the discussions to hold Southern Water to account because it's really important. And thank you for the question. Thank you, Phelan. Um, Samir? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rania. And thank you, Eliana, for that, for, that, for that question. Look, I don't believe that we can't hold Southern Water to account. They are partners with us in the Greater Brighton Economic Board. We chair, we co-chair that board with them. And actually, with that comes, comes influence. And I think it's the soft influence that I think would be quite useful to us here, rather than effectively what we can or cannot do by law. Have they failed? to issue the majority of their sewage spill notifications during the 2020 bathing seasons? Yes. So then they've got a case to, to answer for. If you look at the total statistic in terms of the combined sewer overflow notifications that, that came out and were published between October 19 and September 20, the majority of these surprisingly came out of the bathing season. They did not come within what we normally know and recognize as a bathing seasons. However, that doesn't mean that we can, we can shirk or, or push aside that issue because we have seen that rapid growth in water sports participation, participation. We saw it during lockdown. It means we have to more than ever, I think, protect blue spaces, whether they're rivers or the sea or, or any water surface that we have. Because these beaches, as, as we have seen again during lockdown, they are, they are, you know, they are our playgrounds. They are the space where we can spend a lot of our time. You know, they're the ones that, that deliver health, prosperity and well-being for us. And they're certainly the ones that kept, uh, I suspect, a lot of us um, sane during lockdown. So making sure that they remain in the state that they're in is absolutely crucial for, for the state of nature in our city, for our biodiversity, Sorry, and make sure that we need to carry on looking after them. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, perfect. So um, moving on to our seventh question by um, Pascal. This will be answered by Phelan, Samir, and then Gary. Yeah, hello. Uh, yeah, my name is Pascal. Thank you for taking uh, my question on. Um, so I was wondering what is the council strategy to help with biodiversity and wildlife in um, a more biodiverse managed green space? So for instance, a lot of our green space and road verges are maintained as a basic frequently mown grass. 
where wildflower or trees could be replanted to help with both climate change and citizen well-being. So is there a plan to implement a surface target, for instance, to plant uh, wildflower and trees uh, in green spaces by 2030? Thank you. Thanks for the question, Pascal. I had a question on this last night at Policy and Resources Committee too, so it's really good to see so much interest. Biodiversity is also facing a crisis, and that's why the carbon neutral plan that we passed includes really important work on nature and environment priority and the carbon offsetting cross-cutting theme. These in particular will have a beneficial impact on biodiversity as well as the climate. We're in the middle of preparing a city downland estate plan. Um, every household in the city was sent a postcard on that. So that's natural systems is one of the key themes, which we'll then uh, we'll plan to address. We're bringing out new planning guidance on biodiversity to ensure that we are securing the new uh, so-called biodiversity net gain that is required by the planning rules. We're also part of the biosphere that the Greens introduced when we were last running the council and the governance of how we manage the natural environment of the city surrounding Downland and of course our really important marine environment uh, is all included in there. One of the core objectives of that plan is conservation of nature and culture and within that objective there are two big themes of urban greening and strengthening natural capital uh, green councils have also been using their ward budgets to uh, plant things like wildfire meadows. Uh, my con colleague, Councillor Osborne up in Hollingdean, has been doing a lot of that. We have a huge achievement uh, in rewilding Water Hall. Uh, now the, the money is now in the budget. Valley Gardens has been progressed. Valley Gardens too saw us plant new wildfires, trees, 135 new trees, over uh, nearly 3,000 uh, square metres of additional green space, over 1,300 square metres of wildfire meadows. There's more tree planting in the budget. Uh, we're banning pesticides uh, eventually, but we can and we will do more. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Shall I go ahead, Ben? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you for that question. Look, I, I think like... Uh, it, like like Phelan said, effectively a lot of us, and I think the majority of us councillors are using our word budgets to support the planting of trees and biodiversity in our particular wards. Is is that enough? I think like everything else, and you're, you'll hear me say this consistently, we don't have a consistent and systemic and systematic approach to how we write policy, how we evolve it, and how we um, actually deliver on it. So in terms of the city council, what does the city council needs to do? It needs to incorporate policies on retrofitting by the biodiversity into existing buildings and into new developments. Do we do and enforce that? We don't. Our landscape managers in the park, do they need to rethink how they manage and maintain green spaces in our parks? Yes, they do. Do all of them do that? Not necessarily, but we're making progress. Coming back to the water companies, you know, do they ensure that biodiversity is promoted in their assets and the land that you'll see around the city that's landlocked for them? Do they do that? Do they create such schemes for that? No, they don't. The same applies for obviously for landowners. I think crucially, more importantly, after the pandemic, the National Health Service can and should build on its Healthy New Towns program. And I think I've spotted my former colleague, Diane, Smith somewhere on the court. So the Town and Country Planning Association has done a lot to actually promote and create biodiversity and, and working with, with the healthy new towns. You then need to turn to our professionals who build design and do all of this, our, our built environment professionals. They should integrate that into all of their designs. We should force it on developers. We don't do that. And I think we should. And the same applies for our for businesses that operate in our city. It has to be a collective effort. Thank you so much, Samir. And um, Gary, if you could answer now, please. Thank you. The State of Nature 2018 report revealed that 15% of all wildlife in the UK is now threatened with extinction. Butterflies have declined by 16% and 40 million birds have disappeared from the UK skies in the last half century. Brighton Hove declared a biodiversity emergency in 2018. And we must take urgent action now to reverse the decline in our wildlife and loss of natural habitats. We have to work together to stop pollution of our land and seas and reinstate the conditions that will encourage back the diversity of plants, trees and wildlife that are disappearing before our eyes. The councillors working with partners to create diverse habitats across the city 
and to open up more land for nature. We are a lead partner in the Living Coast, UNESCO Biosphere, and supported Nature 2020, a city initiative aimed at encouraging more people in the care and conservation of local nature. We've created more than 20 bee and butterfly banks of local wildflowers in the city, and earlier this year introduced a new planning condition to incorporate swift and bee breaks. We agreed to the rewilding of the former golf course at Waterhall, and we've also done wildflower planting in valley gardens and other parts of the city, and promoted the loss of trees through a, in the, across the city through Dutch Elm and Ash Dieback. What we really, really need in this city is a strategic plan to where we're going to go with this. And that's something we need to do when we declare the climate and ecological emergency. We need to identify habitats and species that are of national, regional, local importance. And we need a strategy that will plan to ensure that plants, animals and ecosystems are conserved, protected and enhanced. And that that progress is tracked using measurable targets. I hope to work with colleagues and to ensure cross-party support in the months ahead to look at our biodiversity strategy plan and to develop it and to incorporate, it, incorporate new ways of doing it across our city. Thank you. Thank you, all three of you. Um, the next question is asked by Les, who is um, not able to attend today. So taking the necessary steps to achieve carbon neutrality by 2030 will involve being bold and getting many more people on board. After a successful climate assembly and youth assembly in late 2020, what role do you see for further citizens' assemblies, juries, and other forms of participatory democracy? What about participatory budgeting too? How will you make this happen in practice? Um, so Samir could start, then Gary, then Philem. So Samir. Brilliant, thank you, Rani, and thank you, Les. Look, there's a lot of ground to cover in a minute and a half, particularly the, that last bit. So I'll, 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 I'll focus on on the participatory budgeting piece. You know, it's, it's not new. It's been with us for a very long time. You know, I, I remember when we worked on, on, on our resilient cities programs with, with a previous employer, Porto Alegre, the city of Porto Alegre in Brazil, where participatory budgeting began in the late 80s, was really a pioneer and pushed through it. So you need to start, you need to persevere, and you need to develop. At the time, I think 10 years into their program, they had something like 20% of the total city budget be, being set by local communities. If you look at a, a UK wide context, most cases are small and they effectively focus on community grant allocations. So it, and it can be even smaller. I think Les's point about how do we move on and how do we make this happen? I think we need a forum, it could be the Citizens' Assembly, to decide how much we can spend of our public money in, in, in the city. But I think more importantly, we then need to scale that up and see what we can do within the greater Brighton area, because, that's in, because you cannot do one without the other. And then you can begin to look at the size, the scope of the budget, and what outcomes you want across, as I was saying before, across all of the interconnected bits that cut across all of that, because you cannot have an impact if you spend that money on one sector alone, but you need to get that message out to the people participating in your program. Thank you. Thank you, Samir. Um, Gary? Thank you very much for the question. Um, we've talked about citizens' assemblies, and they are one method of public participation that has received a lot of interest over the past 18 months. They bring together people from all walks of life, selected randomly, but are democratic demographically representative, to consider public issues over days and through meetings. The assemblies hear evidence, question witnesses, and deliberate with one another before reaching recommendations. Citizen engagement has to move away from simple validation to become an opportunity for people to actively influence and shape the priorities that Council set, with a healthy and mutually reinforcing balance between representative and participatory democracy. There are many benefits. It helps bring disengaged citizens back into the democratic process. It empowers our residents. It supports the development of local focused evolution agreements. It helps to improve service design and outcomes, and it increases legitimacy. Participatory budgeting, while based on use of local settings, has the ability to be scaled up to make decisions about entire regions as well. The, de the decisions made by participatory budget forums should be binding and careful consideration should be given towards ensuring that the citizens involved 
but given enough information to reach decisions. This helps avoid feelings of... Sorry, Gary, I'm going to have to cut you off there. Okay. Um, Phelim, could you answer, please? Um, we welcome the advisory board input and the Youth Assembly and want those voices to continue. We've asked the Climate Assembly members to stay engaged. One of the biggest barriers we face for more assemblies is just the budget and setting a topic that the council can influence. For example, transport, we have some control. Planning policy, which is really important, we don't have that much. Our city is full of fantastic voices for change, so we can be creative about this as well. We're committed to participatory democracy. Uh, that's why when we last ran the council, we introduced the committee system um, instead of the cabinet system. But we also welcome public involvement too. As I was mentioning, with the Downland Estate Plan, we've sent a postcard to every household. We're also using what's known as planning for real techniques. So that's basically where you use modeling and through a computer to engage residents in a vision for the next 100 years of Downland. Our environment, environmental education program is going to engage thousands of young people. The low traffic neighborhood project started as community groups campaigning and we've done participatory My Dream Street projects with residents in Hanover. We recently led the organization of the event to launch Hydrogen Hus Sussex, which had nearly 300 sector leads, councillors, MPs, civil servants engaged in how we can position Greater Brighton and Sussex as a hydrogen hub to decarbonise our transport. We're in the middle of recruiting a new communications officer so that they can focus on engaging communities. We're introducing more participatory budgeting and the decisions tenants and leaseholders take around our council estate. There's a lot of work the council's already doing on the circular economy, both in terms of the reuse of household waste and the reuse of building materials. Um, we're going to use old wood for things like insect hotels in some of our new upcoming housing. And finally, on community wealth building, we want to take a lead on this. And that, of course, involves more participatory democracy as it looks to see how we can develop community resilience, wealth for our communities and keep things local and reduce carbon emissions at the same time. Thank you. Thanks, you, Fiona. Um, so our ninth question is going to be asked by Max. This will be asked by Gary, Phelim, and then Samir. Hi, thank you very much for organising this and thanks to the councillors for taking part. I've got a question for the councillors. Do they agree that continuing to allow road planners to prioritise motor vehicles discriminates against people who don't have or don't want access to a car? Thank you for your question. And um, could Gary answer first, please? Thank you very much. Once again, thanks for the questioner. Cities and towns are predominantly designed around the car. Cars are attractive to many people and have numerous advantages and benefits in many situations. However, cars also have a negative health, environmental, social and economic impact. The challenge is to re redesign cities and towns to reduce car use. Therefore, it is extremely difficult and we will reverse the status quo of the past 70 years if we can do this. If policymakers are to reduce people's journeys by car, they need to make other options more attractive to people than driving. It's really important that we protect those citizens in our city who do not use a car, such as cyclists and pedestrians. We need to develop high quality neighbourhoods as opposed to simply building more houses, ideally within a 20 minute walk. We need to improve public transport provision to encourage people to walk and cycle across our cities and towns. And we need to take steps to reduce the number of cars within our cities and towns. What we really need to do is increase our efforts to reduce car dependency, both locally and at national level. There is significant support for measures to reduce car use, including low emission zones, push through in this council, using filtering on neighborhood streets and low traffic neighborhoods and residential areas. We must ensure some solutions are fair for all people and give people a genuine choice in how they travel mm. and how they live. Understanding people who live and drive in cities is critical if we are to process this further and to carry the support of our citizens with us. In Council, I push for a road traffic reduction strategy, which aims to protect our, protect our cyclists and pedestrians and take the emphasis away from car use to protecting people who also use our car or road spaces. Safe mobility around our city is central to the quality of life for all who live in Brighton and Hove. More can be done, 
and we should continue to work cross party in this council to ensure that those people that don't drive a car or use a car are having enough options to walk and cycle and are protected in that journey. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. And now, Phelan, please. Thanks. Yes, I agree. When developments prioritise car access, there are huge impacts on the quality and the quality of access. For example, the presumption that people can drive to their nearest supermarket increases a poverty premium, whereas the concept of the low traffic neighbourhood that we're rolling out in Hanover is that primarily people should be able to walk to nearby facilities, play in streets, cycle, walk and scoot, especially beneficial for younger children, and that we're fundamentally safer from speeding traffic. But it's also about public health that we were just toxic like air pollution and noise pollution and disturbance. The last census, as I was saying earlier, two out of five Brighton and Hove households don't own a car or van. That compares uh, to a lot, a uh, lot lower uh, in the southeast of England. But the census also told us that people in social rented housing are less likely to own a car, so people on lower incomes. We want to move away from the idea of highways to more planting of trees, green space such as that in uh, Valley Gardens. We're already underway on improving the public realm and making streets for people, not just cars. We want to share road space uh, because it improves access and improves our community resilience. Um, I think it's also worthwhile remembering that developers prioritising highways can create what are known as food deserts. Uh, however, those tend to favour uh, car owning customers and those with a stable income. We know from a lot of research that older, low-income residents as well, for instance, find it difficult to benefit from the offer that uh, appear to make supermarkets a good deal. For example, low, low-income customers, they can't buy the bulk buys or the two-for-one offers, and therefore a cycle deprivation sets in, exacerbating existing health inequalities. People need cars, so for example, disabled people or the emergency services uh, also need clearer roads with less traffic. So a modal shift to other forms of transport or people choosing to walk or cycle rather than drive who can enables fairer access. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now Samir, please. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. And, and, and thank you for that question. Look, yeah, should they um, carry on doing this? The answer is the answer is no. Are we adopting the right approach? Probably not. So we have a new, I think we've heard earlier that we have a new transport plan we don't have a mobility plan so we don't have that holistic view across all of our transport uh, shifts so we continue to think in that traditional way that the highway engineers have have pushed us um, to do over over an, a, n a number of years you know and and we're not I mean I come I come from Jordan and if you want to look at roads designed by highway engineers you know that's the place to go where you get you know, 30, 40 meter streets in small residential neighborhoods, you know, we're doing much better. However, we've got guidance in, in terms of what, what ought to work for all of us here. So we had the manual for streets. I think we had the first edition in 2007. We had the second edition, the manual for streets two in, in 2010. And we are now looking at coming soon, I think, manual for streets three, all of those are there, you know, so we, we know exactly what we need to do. We know that we need to look at our corner alignments of our streets, you know, where, where we turn, where we turn a corner, we know how to design those bulb outs, you know, where you get uh, an extension into the road space to allow people, um, if you like space out to spread. And we did that during, during the pandemic with the government funding, allowing people to, to socially distance while on, while on sidewalks and sit in those places and enjoy a time out where, where we were open. We, we, I, I believe what we did in East Street, for example, is that we covered those with asphalt. So we didn't really take good advantage of what we can do. Parklets is what the city of Milan is doing. So effectively incorporating biodiversity in all of these bulb out extensions. Um, you know, we're currently engaged in debates around the number of cars going through our streets as part of both Towards Hall Valley, the big development and the cycle trading estate and so on. But what we lack again is a holistic view in order to give us the answer that then can go back to the transport plan and say, this is not what you should be doing. This is what you want. we want you to do because this is our approach and, and this is how we want things to change. So we need to be proactive. Uh, and I don't believe we're proactive enough because the answers are out there. You know, We just need to we pick them up and run with them. Thank you so much. Um, so we've got a final question. Um, it's asked by Sally and it'll be answered by Phelan, Samir and Gary. 
Okay, hi. Um, so the question is, how can low traffic neighbourhoods contribute towards the council's goals for carbon reduction? Thank you so much. Um, Philo? So it's great news that on Tuesday, the Environment Committee agreed our first low traffic neighbourhood in Hanover. That came from an idea from Councillor Lane Hills, who's one of the ward councillors there. We've learnt from the London boroughs and other, and the experience of the Walvin so uh, LTN showed an overall drop off of 38% in traffic, which wasn't displaced into neighbouring streets, and a decrease in total street crime as well. In whole chunks of our city, uh, and my word certainly, this is the case, most houses don't have front gardens. The streets weren't built for the, the traffic and certainly not the volume of traffic we have on some of our streets. Uh, as I was saying earlier, uh, low traffic neighbourhoods are streets for play, streets for health with less traffic, there's less air pollution, and also it's part of encouraging a modal shift as well. We need to massively reduce the number of short car journeys for the sake of our health and the environment. Half of the journeys under two kilometres are taken by car. Also it can be at set up using planters, allowing for more flower planting and positive carbon reduction measures as well. Fewer people driving at speed equals carbon emissions are reduced. They're a key part of how we nudge policy, how we steer behaviour. And the point is to introduce filters and traffic coming measures to keep traffic not destined for the area outside of it. The benefits of this will be much more pleasant and livable areas, which we can then work to improve and make more of. Livable neighbourhoods are a necessary building block for more sustainable cities of the future. It goes hand in hand with other measures to improve our communities that also reduce carbon. In Hanover, we had My Dream Street, uh, and that work showed how in addition to reductions in traffic, increases in play, we can improve community connections, reducing the need to travel far. Thank you. Thank you, Philem. Um, Samir? Lovely. Thank you. Thank you, Rania. And, and thank you for that question. Um, and it kind of comes in nicely on, on the back of the previous one, if you like, in terms of how are we designing our roads, because our, our relationship with the street is different in different parts of the city. And I think Hanover is, is for example, very different from Hove Park in terms of the distance between the housing and, and the actual roads, road, road space for, for, for cars and, and bicycles, etc., and traffic effectively allowing you to do more more within within that space what i would say can you know coming to your question you know can they contribute yes they can it's it's ultimately for me it's the implementation so how do we go about doing that so that we take on board the majority view within a particular area i, I appreciate that hanover has has come through a process uh, and it'll be useful to see whether we can take the lessons from that elsewhere in the city I, I put that idea to residents of Hope Park not that long ago, and we had a discussion about it uh, at a Goldstone Valley Residents Association meeting because people wanted to know more. So there wasn't that much of a knowledge, and I think some were preoccupied that it could mean a complete change. But actually, I think what it, what it needs to do, it needs to be tailored differently in particular areas, and it needs to respond to the challenges in that area. So do we have data? on how people are traveling within our neighborhoods, where they're traveling to, how they're traveling, how much time they spend away, are they traveling for work, for shopping, et cetera? No, we don't. Because if we had that information, we can then actually begin to tailor our responses to these things and actually incorporate that, which is more important, into the current big development plans that are coming through the system, which are going Thank to you, push more traffic into residential neighborhoods. Thank you, Rania. Uh, great, Gary? Thank you very much. Thank you, Sally, for this question. Low traffic neighbourhoods have been successfully introduced both across the UK and abroad as a means of tackling traffic issues in our communities. And Brighton Hove's Climate Assembly recently published its recommendations for how our city could meet our target of becoming carbon neutral by 2030. And the top three of those recommendations was the creation of a healthier, low traffic, pedestrianised community. Low traffic neighborhoods help support these climate objectives. They create more space for people to participate in active travel, such as walking, walking, cycling, and scooting. With fewer people driving and more traveling actively, carbon emissions will be reduced, reducing the contribution to climate change. Reducing the environmental footprint of transport is one of the council's aims in our carbon neutral program and climate change strategy. 
Whilst welcoming the pilot scheme in Hanover, I believe we could go further. I suspect there are areas across all our, area, all our city that might benefit from low traffic neighborhoods. And in order to realize the vision and facilitate the development of low traffic neighborhoods, I won approval of the ATS committee strip recently to introduce a strategy to look at how to roll this initiative across the strip of the city. And it's a strategy that sets out the approach to how Brighton House City Council will consider low traffic neighborhood projects, reinforcing that development and implementation through a iterative, collaborative and holistic process. Research indicates that annually, some early deaths are attributed to poor air quality. Reducing the dominance of cars in our residential areas counters this trend. And it's something that we need to work at at a city at introducing low traffic neighborhoods to protect all our citizens, to protect the livelihoods of them and their health going forward. And I'm happy to Thank work you. collaboratively with my fellow councillors on this. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome. Um, so I'd just like to thank everyone who's um, put forward a question today. I think we have um, enough time to have, I think, two questions from the chat box. And um, so we've had some picked out. And um, the first one is by Michael Creedy. If you would want to ask your question, just open to any council who has any thoughts when, about, um, about action. Hi, sorry, I wasn't quite listening to that. Um, so my question was regarding the ability to have an understanding of the amount of impact that proposals will have on the successful outcome of reducing our footprint. How will this work? Um, so that's qu that question is open to um, any of the councillors have any thought. Uh, and Tamsin's actually put it in the chat if you'd like to read the question in full. But ben, shall, shall I give this one a crack? Um, right. There's loads and loads of work, but one of the excellent things that local government does really well is collect data. Um, so we have a really good idea at the moment about what is going on in the council. Uh, we know, for example, that in the last two years, the council cut its corporate carbon emissions by 9.9%. Um, and all of the members, uh, Samir, Gary and myself on the Carbon Neutral Member Working Group had an excellent presentation uh, just when we met uh, two weeks ago. And that was about what we're doing throughout the different buildings that the council owns to really track what we're doing with uh, carbon emissions. Um, I think... It's part of a much, much, much bigger process that we need other partners in the city to look at as well. Um, but of course, all of this is part of the much, much, much bigger um, role that a whole load of this uh, stuff has to play in the future. Um, the program that uh, we're rolling out and we've referred to several times today, the carbon neutral uh, program, that's going to cut nearly a third of the city's carbon emissions. And we've measured that. Uh, cut it by nearly a third and then we're, we're, we're thinking that national action could save another third at least. We're going to carry on monitoring progress annually through a key performance indicator on reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and that's from this year onwards as well. So we are trying to track some of this. There's a really important discussion there that we need to um, engage a whole load of the partners around us um, and one of the things that I've been trying to do on the local enterprise partnership, which is how we engage businesses and uh, through our partners, through things like the Biosphere and through the Greater Brighton Economic Board, which brings together a whole load of the councils and the private companies around us. We need all of them to start playing a really big part in monitoring what they're doing to help uh, drive down uh, carbon emissions as well. Thank you so much for your answer, Phil. Um I wasn't sure, Sam, if you had your hand up. You wanted yeah, to yeah. It's just a quick, quick response, but I think just in addition to to what what Phelim said, I mean, I, I agree. We collect a lot of stuff. I mean, I think we collect information rather than rather than data because I think you know it's what we do with that that's that's important. But I think we probably will do you know in 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 time, and I'll certainly be 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 pushing for this is have some sort of a tracker or a dashboard that effectively shows you 
exactly how we're performing against all of all of those targets you know because only then can you hold us hold us to account it's it's not very complicated buildings do that you know buildings have building management systems now that collect all sorts of data about the performance of the building from the ventilation system to the heating system to the energy performance and i think it is not that difficult to get a similar tracker for a city because other cities have done that that effectively then shows you how we're performing against our baseline Thank you, Ben. Thank you so much um, for answering. So um, I think we'll move on to reflections from the councillors. So um, uh, yeah, so councillors would just like to see if what you've enjoyed or found surprising about this event, anything councillors would like to say to people who have asked questions or been listening. Um, so if, if you could all answer, that'd be great. And again, just <laughs> keep it as short as possible since we are losing time fast. Sh shall I start? Um, I, yeah. really in, I really welcome this sort of engagement. Um, sadly, it can't happen in person just yet. Um, and I really would welcome doing this maybe every six months, every year, if you'd like. Um, I, I, I really like the sort of scrutiny. Um, I really like being a you all being able to hold us accountable. And I, I, I welcome... Uh, as people will have seen last night when I think we had five questions on the climate crisis at Policy and Resources Committee as well. So keep those questions coming, keep engaging. You know, we had a really important uh, consultation uh, last week on what's going to happen to the future of things like the cycle lanes in the city. Keep responding to those consultations, keep uh, your pressure up on your ward councillors and keep asking us awkward questions, however weird that might sound for a person in politics, keep asking us awkward questions because it keeps us honest to the process and it keeps us accountable, most importantly, to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. If I could ask Gary to um, to reflect next. Yeah, it's like Phelan, I'd like to support the regular engagement with the citizens of this city. Um, I find today it's been really informative and there's been some really positive questions and it's good to see so many people attending. These issues need to be heard and discussed, and all your councillors will raise them publicly and in the council. I think where we're at is the need to have constructive, collaborative working across all the parties. This will be necessary to tackle many of the environmental issues that have been raised today. This is not a political football. We are all in this together, and it is about a collective vision and strategy, both short term and more importantly, longer term, that will benefit the city one that is participatory and engages and listens to our residents. And we've today talked about participatory democracy and regular events like this can only aid and abet that process. And I, for one, welcome questions from my constituents, regular lens being put on me, and I'm sure all councillors do. It's what we're here for. We're not just here to do the nice things. We need to be nodded. We need to be poked and prodded. And I'm more than happy, uh, as well as my fellow councillors, I'm sure, join me in welcoming today and also the future engagement with yourselves. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. And finally, Samir. Brilliant. Thank you, Ben. And, and, and thank you to you, Rania, and, and the organising team. It was, it, it, was, it was brilliant. You know, I've, you know, I'd do this again. You know, whenever you want me to do this, I'm, I'm, I'm up for it. And thank you for everybody for a joining and coming coming in with your with your questions. And I'm hoping we gave you what you wanted, or at least parts of what you wanted. I think we, we all of us between us, we, we certainly tried. I think there are key takeaways um, for me, you know, and, and, you know, this is an area I, I work in, you know, so I see these challenges day to day. I, I train planners for a living and I struggle and I fight with people every day to get them to see that actually training planners is more about training planners to sit in the local authority to process planning applications, partly because an algorithm will probably be doing that, you know, you know, before, before too long. Actually, this is more about the skills that people need. And one of those skills is engagement. So it is engagement with, with you guys and with everybody out there, because I think that's crucial. Our infrastructure is changing. It will look very different in 2030 than, than today, certainly I think the amount of renewables coming in from offshore and wind will be completely different. I think we're set to double that by, by 2030 nationally, which means a lot of change for everything. One of your questions was for on EV infrastructure. We didn't even touch on that. 
And, and I think our cities will look very different because of all of these things coming on board. The challenge for us and for you is to engage and ask and challenge, but also to have the right professionals that we need, like our, our transport planners to help us deliver that change you know, by 2030. Yeah, so um, I'd just like to say a final thanks to everyone who's attended this meeting. It's really encouraging to see everyone here. Thanks to the councillors who have given up their time for this. And obviously, thank you for the organising team. It would not be possible without them. So thank you, everyone. Um, great. Also, yeah, also want to say thank you to everyone. And also, after the success of this Q&A, we will be having a follow-up event to specifically ask councillors questions about their ambitions and hopes for the Brighton and Hope 2030 Carbon Neutral Plan which has been developing for years and how they plan to involve residents of Brighton and Hove in this urgent need for action. So stay tuned.